Mark Halpern and John Heileman, uh, you have the show on uh, Showtime, The Circus. You're also the author of uh, both Game Change and Double Down, Game Change 2012. Uh, how did this? Uh, you you've been very much associated as like now staples of the American election. How did this partnership? Come uh oh. <laughs> oh. Have we lost him? Still with us? What? Are you still there? Wait. Yes. You cut out at the end, Charles. Oh, I cut out at the end there. I apologize for that. Okay. I was just saying, uh, you've been staples of um, the American election scene for some time now. Uh, how did the partnership come about between you two? Uh, we were we met each other on J-Date. Um, no, we were, uh, you know, Mark and I both had, had been covering politics for a long time uh, and run into each other over the years and uh, become friendly and covering campaigns past. And then in 2008, uh, we both uh, were at a, a John McCain event out in Annapolis, Maryland, and we both uh, uh, had been noodling over in our heads the notion that it was crazy that no one was writing a book about that election. It was kind of so extraordinary. We were in the middle, still in the middle of the Democratic nomination fight, and uh, McCain had just wrapped up the Republican nomination, and, and we both were kind of amazed, as I said, that no one was doing a book. And as we uh, made a long drive back from Annapolis to Washington, D.C., we started uh, kicking around ideas for how we might uh, collaborate on a book, and that ultimately led to game change. There's two, there's two elements that were present in the books that we were both attracted to that are a big part of the circus, which is two things that are unfortunately missing from a lot of the political coverage in the country, particularly in the digital age when social media and Twitter or web and daily cable drive so much of the thing. One is storytelling, the importance of actually sitting down and thinking about plot and characters and drama and humor and all those things that great stories have. Humanity. Yeah. And the other is characters. And the fact that, you know, in the circus we try to focus as much as possible as we did in our books on the people involved here and think of them as human beings, not about politics, so that really you're telling stories that happen to be about politics, but they're really more about a big competition, a big interesting high-pressured competition. So we both, as we talked about doing the books, were attracted to those elements of it and both saw what we thought was an opportunity to provide that kind of rich storytelling uh, in book form and now try and do the same thing with the circus. And, and with the circus, how do you, like, it's sort of like part political show, part reality show, part documentary, part, like, sort of like, how did that sort of like the evolution of sort of game change lead to the circus, and what, like, do you see the circus primarily as? Well, it's a little bit of both, right, um, of all those things. Um, you know, Mark and I had uh, been talking about uh, about how to do something original and, and novel in terms of how to do a, like a, a TV, how to c cover this campaign. Um, obviously, we have our show on Bloomberg and MSNBC where we uh, we were trying to uh, work within the, the cable news format to, to cover this election, but we also thought there was a way to bring um, some, documentary, uh, some documentary skills and documentary approaches to doing this campaign. And our third partner, Mark McKinnon, uh, had had an idea for a long time about trying to do a real-time documentary uh, that would be much like what we ended up with the, with the circus, which was to try, try to go out with the kind of orientation of, of people who are, who are news reporters and are interested in what's happening um, in real time and how the story is changing on a day-to-day -day basis, but also bringing the production skills and production quality of uh, cinema quality documentary to that. And it was Mark's, uh, this long-held idea of his with our uh, some ideas that we were thinking about that eventually kind of merged together to form the pitch for the circus and I think we think of it as all those things. I mean, we're, we're really trying to be, uh, in terms of production, in terms of what we shoot, how we shoot it, going behind uh, the curtain, so to speak, uh, not shooting from the riser, not trying to look like anything that's on television otherwise in terms of political coverage. All of that, the visual orientation is very documentarian, but we're also very focused, as you can tell from the series, on trying to be up to the minute with the news, right? So the, the circus, one of the things that's kind of amazed people about the show is that we often have things that occurred on Friday or Saturday even, sometimes even Saturday night, that appear in the show on Sunday. So it gives the sense that the show is really topical and really on top of what's actually going on every day on the presidential campaign trail, but with this kind of beautiful, aesthetically compelling gloss uh, that, that, that has all the, the qualities of a really well-hewn and, and fully polished documentary. So one of the interesting things also about the circus, uh, as opposed to the books, is that it, it's as again it's very immediate and it's very it's 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 very right up to the minute. And one of the interesting, I was wondering if I'm trying to figure out how to how to phrase this the best. How do you, how do you feel that how do you feel when about how 
the difference between you know catching someone uh, catching someone's reaction in the moment, especially the people who work on the campaigns who are intricately involved, as opposed to uh, when you're writing your book and it's usually a little while after the fact. Uh, what's, do you ever get the sense a lot of times that they're holding back on a lot of things and you're just wishing you could just poke a bit more at them? Well, it's, it's, it's always a challenge uh, to, uh, you know, both, both the books and, and the circus are attempts at shorthand fly on the wall, right? We want to be places documenting things that are um, interesting and fun, important, emotional, dramatic. Uh, in the case of the books, obviously, you don't need to be there necessarily, although it's great if we can be. But piecing together stories after the fact, you have the, the time, over time, to do lots of interviews and piece, piece great scenes together. In the case of television and the circus, we've got a week. We, we shoot almost everything, you know, more than 99% of what we shoot for any episode, occur, something that occurs in that week. So we've got to be there. The cameras have to be there to make it uh, usable. And, and part of the, the, um, the challenge is to make tough choices by getting the camera in the right place and getting people comfortable with us to cooperate. Um, this is not an investigative series, and we are able to draw along with Mark McKinnon on our long-standing relationships with people in both parties to get people comfortable to have the cameras present. So you always want more, but I think one of the things we're proudest of is we've achieved a lot of the original premises of the show uh, in, in making the show, Often, you know, what you drop in the locker room doesn't happen out on the field. But in the case of cooperation and getting people to, to let us go where we want to go, you always want more, as I said. But we've been pretty happy with the, the ability to show, as John said, something different and something intimate with the candidates and their families and the people around them. I think something interesting um, with like what you've done with your books and what you're now doing with the circus is you are sort of telling the story of the campaign. It's a bit more rather than policy. It's about storytelling. And what's it like, and I think this is different with the circus than your books, is you're telling a story that you don't know the ending to. And how is that like piecing together a story when you don't know where it's going to lead? Well, it's obviously you know uh, it's it's obviously more provisional, right? And but, but and then there's a you know there, you don't have a, you sit down to write a book, you do as you say, you do know what the ending is going to be, and you're constructing a narrative arc that kind of leads from from the beginning to what is a known ending. But at the same time, you know it's interesting how even though we have a nonstop news cycle and there's the, the story is constantly changing changing in a presidential campaign, there is still a kind of weekly rhythm to what happens out of the campaign trail. And especially in the first part of the year when we had primaries and caucuses, you know, basically every week, whether that was happening mostly on Tuesdays, sometimes on Saturdays, but you have individual contests that were going to have resolution. Someone was going to win the New Hampshire primary. Someone was going to win the Iowa caucuses. Someone was going to drop out of the race after the South Carolina primary. So there were built in um, kind of tent poles in the given weeks that would give you the ability to structure a narrative around what was happening in that given week. What was the big story of that week? What was the big drama? Uh, what was at stake for the characters? Um, where were the pre points of pressure? Where do people have to perform particularly well? Where do they where they have the most to lose and the most to gain? Um, those little narrative bubbles that would encapsulate a given week were not that hard to find. And so, you know, much like the um, much like the books where we knew how the whole election turned out, the good thing about by the end of the week with the circus, by the time we sat down to do the final edit on Saturday night, we at least knew how the week stories had ended and were able to uh, hopefully create a sense of narrative arc even within each, each individual episode. Uh, one thing I'm always interested with people who cover politics is um, uh, when they first became interested in it. Um, I remember first being mesmerized by the 1994 U.S. Senate race here in Virginia between Chuck Robb and Oliver North. That was my first gateway into politics and to me just being completely fascinated by it. Uh, I'm interested to know what were yours uh, in terms of what was the, the, fir the first sort of gateway where you thought this is interesting? Well, I grew up in, in the Washington, D.C. area, so my hometown paper was the Washington Post. And um, I found, you know, the first campaign I covered was 88. Um, but I found uh, the, the 84 race, uh, as much as it was a route when I was in college, it would be pretty interesting to watch the country uh, sort of choose up sides and to make a, a decision about where, the, where everybody wanted to go collectively as a nation through the prism of presidential campaign. So I'm interested in other other levels of politics, and I'm interested in other things, but I think nothing to me is more compelling than the way we, the unique way we elect our presidents, 
and the degree to which, particularly now when there's so much media, the degree to which the country really does do more than simply pick someone to run the government, but pick someone to represent kind of the current state of where we are as a nation and where we want to go. So probably for me, 84 and then covering 88 uh, for ABC News was when I really decided that's what I wanted to do full time for a living. Yeah, for me, you know, I grew up in California, um, out in, in Los Angeles, and so, you know, my my childhood was uh, was spent under uh, Governor Ronald Reagan, and then when I was in high school, was when Reagan was first elected president in 1980. So, um, the, you know, the growing up in a state that had uh, a governor who was clearly uh, a figure, a guy who had national ambitions and was, who was seen as a huge important figure in the uh, emerging uh, conservative movement. Uh, Reagan was an object of obsession for a lot of people in California, and and when he ran for president in 1980, it was a very divisive figure within the state of California. People who were uh, liberals regarded Reagan as as an abomination, and people who were uh, part of that conservative movement, and and a lot of sort of middle class moderates uh, like my father, you know, were very uh, ca caught up in Reagan. So um, again, somehow kind of Reagan felt like although a lot of people don't think of him as a as a Californian figure, he really was, and and those the the first. Presidential elections that really shaped my consciousness were were those the one Mark mentioned eighty four once I was in college but really nineteen eighty um, being a high school student uh, learning you know the basics of American government and learning about um, you know learning that from textbooks but then also seeing this guy who was this huge figure from my home state go on to become uh, uh, the president of the United States and and becomes a kind of a landmark figure in the country I was sort of hooked at that point and and, and by the time I got to college I knew that uh, that studying politics writing about politics and focusing on politics was probably what I was going to end up doing for the rest of my life. I, I just do have to have a quick follow-up on that since you said you're from California and you grew up with Ronald Reagan. The guy who took over after Ronald Reagan was actually back in the news this week because he is now governor of California again, Jerry Brown, Governor Moonbeam, who, um, you know, will just, it seems, will just never go away. Uh, what was it like seeing him in, uh, endorse Hillary Clinton after all the animosity that has been on display between uh Brown and the Clintons, going back to 1992. Well, you know, I, 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 cover, I, I was at the debate where Jerry Brown famously went hard after Hillary Clinton uh, on stage with Bill Clinton in 92, when Bill Clinton and Jerry Brown were both running for president. And I've covered the Clinton since then and Governor Brown since then. And on one human level, you would think, man, no one who ever said something like that about someone else's spouse, no way you could ever reconcile but the thing about Governor Brown and the Clintons is they are ultimate politicians, ultimate transactional figures. And so it's now Jerry Brown's interest to endorse the Clintons. It's in the Clintons' interest to accept the endorsement. And so it was fascinating to see the arc from 92 to today, but not really a surprise for any politicians, but particularly for those three. I think, um, like, I, 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 that sort of, like, makes me think of with this series that you're doing, and you, you're both so, like, sort of fly on the wall to a degree in telling these stories. What, like, this is one of the craziest election seasons that has ever been the case. Like, they've really, the candidates have really been looking after the circus for you. Yeah. Um, what, like, what is the thing that has surprised each of you the most in the 2016 race? Well, I think, you know, the, there, I, I think I probably answer for both of us. But, I mean, the two biggest stories of the 2016 race have been the rise of Donald Trump and the rise of Bernie Sanders. Um, and they've been the dominant figures in this, in this campaign, even though uh, Secretary Clinton is going to be the Democratic nominee uh, and likely, the, probably the most likely next president of the United States. It's the case that those two guys, Trump and Sanders, have dominated the debate more than anyone uh, else in, in either party uh, and, and more unexpectedly. Um, you know, a year ago, Donald Trump wasn't even in the presidential race, and Bernie Sanders was considered, uh, he, although he had gotten into the race, was not considered someone to be reckoned with, was not taken seriously by most of the national press and by most Americans who still didn't know who he is. And yet, in the year since then, um, they have been, you know, they have been uh, huge figures and, and had done something shocking in both cases. I mean, no one expected Donald Trump to be the Republican nominee um, and beat 16 other people to, to do so. He was not even a member of the Republican Party a couple of years ago, and neither was Bernie Sanders a member of the Democratic Party, and yet he's affected the de Democratic debate profoundly. He's pulled Hillary, Hillary Clinton to the left. He's gained millions of votes. He's inspired you know tens of millions of millennials uh, to, to in their first encounters with politics to become uh, engaged in this process. So those two guys, again, if you'd asked anybody, including us, um, although we took uh, Brown, we took both uh, both both Sanders and Trump seriously from the very beginning. If you'd asked either one of us, would they become the dominant figures of the race a year ago? 
Uh, I don't think we necessarily would have predicted things would have turned out the way they did. It's been a huge surprise for both of us. The only other thing I'd add is I really thought Jeb Bush would do better than yeah. he did. Uh, I, I, I recognize there was a lot of skepticism about him, and I, and I knew he'd have to struggle and fight, as did he. But, you know, we showed him pretty intimately on the circus uh, in the early episodes, and I think people who watch the show got a sense of what a thoughtful, hardworking um, uh, 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 leader that he was and, and, and had been in Florida and remained, and yet voters just were not interested in the Republican Party and anybody like Jeb Bush, and in fact, really, it's pretty clear now that he didn't have a chance. There were, his performance was uneven, but had he performed perfectly, I don't think he had a chance because the mood of the electorate was just not to have another Bush as their nominee. And well, just a quick like, follow-up there. Like, I think something that I've been a bit surprised by that maybe you guys can explain to me is – like we've seen with Trump and Sanders, this massive sort of like desire for anti-establishment. At the same time, we've got the sitting president's approval numbers not looking too bad. They're not like where Bush was when he was sort of uh, on his way out of the presidency. How do you align those two sort of uh, metrics? Uh, not easily, um, but I think look, there's a there is a uh, I, at the end of a lot of presidential two-term presidential administrations, you get to the place where um, especially in the middle of di really divisive presidential campaigns, whoever happens to be in office, whether it's George W. Bush, whether it's uh, whether it's Barack Obama, whether it's Bill Clinton at the end of his term, um, whether it was Ronald Reagan at the end of his two terms, you see often their approval ratings rise. Bush was a slight exception because of the financial crisis that happened at the end of his term, but for most of those presidents, their approval ratings rise on their way out the door because they acquire a certain patina of nostalgia about them even before they leave, and they seem like elevated figures, governing figures, like adults, grown-ups in the White House, while the two parties are fighting it out in these kind of brutal negative ways out on the campaign trail. You know, it is the case that although we have Donald Trump as the presumptive nominee on the Republican side, and you have Hillary Clinton as the presumptive nominee almost on the Democratic side, they're the two most unpopular major party nominees in our history. People don't like either one of these guys very much, either one of these characters very much. And in that context, someone like Barack Obama, uh, unless you're a hardcore uh, Republican partisan, someone like Barack Obama, who seems to be mature, seems to be trying to uh, act in the country's interest, someone like that starts to look pretty good to a lot of people. I, I can't, yeah, I mean, that's just, I'm just trying to put my head around, you know, it, all of this, the craziness that's been the past, Six, the past 16 months, and it's it's almost I I can't believe you guys get paid for it. I hope it I hope it covers I hope it covers I hope it covers therapy too because it just must be absolutely absolutely insane. Because I never thought anything could get crazier than Sarah Palin. I never thought anything would get crazier than that whole reveal and then the whole ensuing drama of the Clampets going to uh, Washington. Um, so, speaking of Sarah Palin, though, um, <laughs> one of the most interesting things, though, about that can happen in a presidential campaign, though, is the selection of a running mate. So now we have uh, this one, this uh, unique opportunity where both people are going to be choosing running mates. I want to take a page out of uh, your second book, Double Down, and uh, with Donald Trump. If you were, if try to put yourself in his mind space, but don't hurt yourself for the love of God. Don't hurt yourself. Um, if he were to double try to double down on his brand, who would who should he pick as his running mate? If he was if he was specifically he wasn't worried about you know carrying a state, he wasn't worried about any of that sort of thing. If he was just to operate on his own level, who do you think he would pick or should pick as a running mate there? Bobby Knight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've never, I've never seen Trump throw a chair at someone, but I wouldn't be surprised if. He endorsed such behavior. Maybe the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> I think Lou Ferrigno did endorse him, so I think that would work, actually. That would be awesome. See, so for me, Bixby will be the Hulk forever. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I was thinking, I guess maybe I'm just too conventional. I was thinking Paul LePage would be a great pick, the governor of Maine, because he's just... Well, I mean, the, the, serious, the serious pick who would be doubling down would be Chris Christie. And I think, did... I think that's a real possibility. Do you think Christie would ever? I mean, he has agreed to be subservient, but I, I, I have a very hard time seeing him in that level. I mean, you take I it, remember you take it in a New Jersey minute, which is shorter than a New York minute. Oh, okay. 
Because no, I still re- I still remember that RNC keynote speech. Covered. No one that we've ever covered turns down a vice presidential offer, even though they say they never want it. Okay, so should we be also ready for uh, Tim Kaine as uh, VP running mate as well? Ready for who? Tim Kaine. Uh, certainly a possibility. I think I think both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump recognize the imperative of picking somebody who's perceived as qualified to be president. And I think uh, Senator Kaine, as former governor of Virginia, and based on some of the other life experiences he's had, I think would clear that bar. So I think he's probably on the list. How do you how do you guys approach someone like Donald Trump, who is so prickly and somewhat erratic when it comes to the media? But for a show like The Circus, you need to have a relationship with him to get that sort of like to be able to tell his story. Well, we we had a, you know we we were lucky you know by the time we started doing The Circus, uh, we had enough of a relationship with Trump. You know, Mark had 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 been very focused on Trump in 2012, and and when we wrote Double Down, as you guys at least. One of you who's read the book, you know, um, you know that we wrote a lot about how close he came to running in 2012, and and that was based on a lot of reporting that Mark had done back in that cycle. And then when we got to this cycle, we entered it again, as I said earlier, taking him relatively seriously, th- taking it seriously the possibility he would run, and taking seriously the possibility that he would find at least a decent size uh, market for what he was selling. And so we started doing interviews with him for our daily show. Uh, the day after he announced um, at, at Trump Tower, we were there the day in Trump Tower when he rode down that escalator, and the next day we were up in his office doing the first of seven or eight interviews that we've done with him for, with all due respect. And so by the time we got to uh, starting to work on the circus, we had a pretty good relationship with Trump already um, on the basis of those interviews, and we were able to, uh, to, to in a sense, kind of, uh, uh, kind of capitalize on that, go to him and basically say, hey, you know, we treated you fairly before. Uh, you've done our show a bunch of times. We've interviewed you before. We've asked substantive questions. Um, we've, we've, we think again, we've been tough but fair with you. Um, here's this new thing we're doing, and and maybe you want to be part of it. And, and he and his people have been very agreeable and really helpful in terms of helping us uh, get some of the kind of access that allows viewers of the circus to get to see a side of Trump they don't get to see necessarily in other places. It's interesting that Matt brought that up. I was just thinking about that press conference we saw the other day. Uh, with uh, Donald Trump just going after everyone in the uh, everyone in the media in a way I had never. I, I mean, I, I know it's usually like dogma, like a, a, a strategy point on the particularly on the right to attack the media. But what I saw that day, I have I'd never seen anything like that. Um, are you a bit? Uh, I don't. I don't know. If fearful is the right word, but does it worry you? Should he? Because I I always have to reassure my friends. Or I have to I have to reiterate to my friends that he can't. It's he has a shot at getting elected, and does it does that sort of atmosphere worry you as as reporters as members of the media that of how hostile this could get? Well, it's a challenge for sure. Although we've faced something like it with other candidates, and as you said, particularly on the Republican side, um, it's not uncommon. President Bush, when he was running for election, Bush forty one. Uh, would often sort of whip the crowd up against the media at the end of that race. So it's not a new thing. And certainly Trump, like with most things Trump does, has brought it to a different level. But we have to, look, we have to daily cover the campaign. And so it's never easy it to become part of the story, either as individuals or as a group. And without a doubt, Donald Trump's press conference has made the media uh, part of that news cycle story and to some extent part of the story. But you just have to be disciplined in recognizing that those are two different hats, you know. I think all Americans should be staunch advocates for the First Amendment, but not everyone is, and certainly we have a professional interest in it uh, as a kind of a special interest, but also most people who are in the press believe pretty strongly in the First Amendment, and so we need to look for our, our opportunities institutionally and as individuals to express that view, while at the same time recognizing that, you know, you've got to cover the campaign fairly. The country's so polarized now that that and this is kind of a, a, a subset of the challenge of you're covering candidates who a lot of the country look at and, and look at the candidate they don't support and say anything you say about that candidate that's the least bit positive or even neutral is totally out of line. And so the challenge you're raising is a challenge, but again, it's a subset of the larger challenge of trying to cover things objectively and with an emphasis on scrutiny, openness, tough coverage, uh, and the First Amendment. Uh, in the face of a lot of people who don't care much about those things, at least when it comes to their favorite candidate. 
Do, now, you guys cover candidates in the circus, in uh, WADR, all these sorts of things. What's it like, um, and you've had experiences with sort of game change a little bit, even more so now the circus, of being candidates yourself for the Emmy, for the Emmy race? Um, well, I, I, luckily, uh, I, it's not quite as intense what we're going through in terms of the Emmy race, the, what these guys get to go through. I mean, you know, one of the things that, well, I mean, really just, you know, one of the things that the circus, I think, you know, when we're talking about what we're really trying to do here, right, is I think you know one of the fundamental takeaways from Mark and Mark and I over over covering all the presidential campaigns we've covered is that um, being a president candidate president is really hard. Um, it's like it's the, the level of, of demands, physical demands, emotional demands, uh, spiritual demands, uh, psychic demands that a presidential candidate undertakes when they run for office are it's just extraordinary. It's just it's just a grueling, grinding, hard thing to do. And on some level, whether you like the candidates or not, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you kind of have to admire that they're putting themselves through this. They are super ambitious people, and sometimes they're narcissists, and sometimes they're uh, kind of power, uh, ego-driven, and, and certainly they want a lot, they want power. But they're also really idealistic. They really care about their country. Most of them could make a lot of money uh, and have a much easier life doing something else. And so part of what the circus tries to do is to sort of show people just what it's like to do this and how hard it is and the kind of sacrifice you have to make and how intense the scrutiny is and how high the pressure is, all of that stuff, right? You get a real picture of that, I think, in the show in a way that you don't in shows that are shot from a further distance away, that aren't quite so up close and quite so intimate as our show is. And I say all that just to say, um, compared to all of that that a presidential candidate goes through, doing this with you guys, not that hard. <laughs> You don't get to slam in the competition. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're just, you know, we're just happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, there goes my self-esteem. <laughs> so, um, I wonder, uh, so what was it like to be at uh, the Emmys, knowing you were at the Emmys four years ago with Game Change, and Game Change just swept one movie lead actress for uh, 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 Julianne Moore, writing, directing. Uh, what was that like to see something that you know that started with with you guys getting together and writing this and writing this book uh, go all the way uh, to something like the Emmys? Well, the, the experience with, for us with with Game Change was pretty similar to experience we're having with Showtime, which is kind of misleading uh, for the if you want the kind of textbook you know journalists interact with Hollywood and the whole thing is a crashing disaster. Um, the 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 director of Game Change, uh, Jay Roach, the writer, Danny Strong, are now friends of ours. They were extraordinarily solicitous uh, t towards us in terms of wanting to make sure that the film was faithful to the book and that, you know, down to the point of if an actor would improvise a line on set, they'd call us and say, the actor just said this, is that okay, since you guys hadn't approved it. Um, so that was a great experience. And it's been the same with the Circus Showtime. Uh, David Nevins and everyone at Showtime from the beginning uh, understood the editorial vision we had about how to make this work as a weekly documentary that was both editorially uh, airtight but also looked great and had high high production uh, uh, values and, and content. So it, it that experience and this one were both were both great and it was great to be part of that film uh, but to do this where we're, we're, we're involved you know in a much more direct way has also been just a, a great experience regardless of, of what might happen in the fall. Um, just uh, one follow-up question to that. I remember when uh, uh, when the book Double Down was announced, uh, it was also announced that HBO had already also optioned the rights to that, and um, it, there was a lot of speculation about um, that being made into a movie. Are you allowed to uh, discuss uh, what happened there, or what's is is that still a possibility to see Game Change 2012 movie? Still a possibility. Um, stay tuned, as they say in television. Right. Yeah. Um, we can't say that much about it, but we can say that it's not a, it's not by any means, not a, it's not a closed chapter in our lives. We're, uh, we'd still like to see that happen at some point down the line, and there are a lot of kind of interesting creative ideas that we have about how to do it. All, all, I, all I will say is Giancarlo Esposito for uh, Barack Obama and Bruce Campbell for Mitt Romney. Okay, and I have one word in response to you. Ready? Okay. Playmation. <laughs> I would watch that. Can't I say, would so can't watch say, that. Can't say more. All I can say is, think Mr. Bill on steroids. Oh God, this is gonna be. Oh God, this is gonna be the greatest movie ever. <laughs>
Yeah. You, yeah. Been doing Objectively, you're right. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine the claymation Joe Biden? Just think about that. <laughs> Are you kidding? I'm still. I'm just. I'm. I'm just. I, I'm a Biden fan, and I've just. But I was. I've just been wishing that he had run because I would have. They could have sold tickets to that debate between him and Trump. That would have been amazing to watch. We would have bought them all. Oh God. Are we going to see a book for this particular campaign? They say in the book business, stay tuned. <laughs> I feel like you're dodging the question, Mark. Yeah, we're, focused, we're really focused on the circus. So the book, the possibility of a book will take care of itself. But, you know, we're shows coming back in July for four episodes around the conventions, and then we'll be back in the fall. And as as fun as the first twelve were, and as much as we learned, these are gonna these episodes are gonna have unique challenges. Uh, the conventions are always tough to cover. There's so much security. There's so much media there. And then the fall general election, the debates, and 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 all the and all the logistics of that. So we're really focused on trying to uh, make the next two uh, batches of the circus. And and like I said, the book any any book will take care of itself. But I will say this: I gave you a little claymation hint on a possible film off Double Down. I'll tell you one thing about the book we do on this race. Scratch and Sniff? It's going to be both Pop-Up and Scratch and Sniff. Never done before. Whoa. Never done before. That's an exclusive. Two, I am already pre-ordering it. Well, two old-style book technologies. And I'm, I'm arguing for holograms. So if but we can get all three of those together, when you just open, imagine. When you open the Trump page and the hair pops up and you can scratch it and smell his conditioner, it's going to be big. Oh, really? Do, do you have a favorite episode, guys, of the season so far? We love all our children equally. <laughs> yeah. I think the, 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 I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this. I do think you know one of the things that's true about this series is that you know we decided to do it relatively late last year, and um, so we, we and we ultimately got the deal done and, and embarked on pre-production relatively late, and so. Um, this is a very complex, editorially and logistically, a very complex uh, production. You know, we have always three crews, sometimes four, sometimes even five crews out in the field at one time, covering at, at when we started, you know, 17 Republican candidates and, and four or five Democratic candidates at the outset, um, all of them on planes, all of them kind of reacting in a given moment to what the news is going to be. So as I say, editorially complicated to follow the news and try to do a real-time documentary, logistically complicated to move all those people around, all the stuff that's going on in the edit rooms uh, back in New York while we're out in the field, all that kind of happening, it was it took a little while for us to find our sea legs and kind of figure out how all this was going to work and, and come up with a really good uh, workflow and, and a modus operandi that was that was feasible to get the show done and pull out the high wire act of doing uh, what we do every single week to get the show on the air. So I think if you look at the, at the at the first 12 episodes, the one thing I'll say is I think they got better as you went along. And that's not, I guess, unusual in, in episodic television. But um, we started out, we think, pretty strong. But I think episode to episode, the series just gets better as you go through it. There was a, And as the field winnowed and we could focus more on, 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 on a smaller number of characters, um, that also helped in terms of, uh, kind of getting to the core of what we're trying to do, which is you know the high human drama of politics. I love the reckoning. Big fan. Right. We're big. We're big fans of that episode. Yeah. You right. know, they're they're all, very good one. They're all all twelve are on Showtime anytime. People can go watch them and, and and decide for themselves whether the reckoning is in fact the best one. But the uh, the reality is, as John said, we learned a lot going forward. But every one has stuff in it that I like a lot, and yeah. that's why. You know, when we were sitting down trying to figure out which ones to submit for the Emmys um, consideration, it is a tough call because because I can look at ev all, any of the 12 episodes and say, man, there's something in there that we're really proud of, really special, something you, you won't see in normal daily coverage. And, you know, we are aspiring to make something that's not disposable. Um, you know, with all due respect to our show, with all due respect, <laughs> there aren't that many episodes you could go back and, and watch now with the same impact as the day they aired because it's about daily coverage. That's true of most political coverage on TV. Um, you know, we've talked to people since the series this we went on hiatus, gearing back up for July. We've talked to lots of people as we travel around the country covering the campaign who have binge watched all twelve on Showtime anytime and say they stand up. You know, some people say, "Well, I was hesitant to say, why would I want to watch a show about a campaign where I do already know the outcome at this stage of Trump being the presumptive nominee, Clinton being the likely nominee?" And people have have said because of the 
production quality, because of the storytelling, because of the characters, that they do hold up. And, uh, and again, I, I like to think all 12 of them hold up pretty well. Right. And that's one of the things I think I'd say, you know, further about, you know, you guys were talking earlier about the similarities between the books and, and this enterprise. You know, I, one of the things that's been so inspiring about working on this show has been that everyone has a sense that we're creating kind of a historical document here, that we're trying to, like, this is an incredible election. Um, and it is, for many people, the craziest election they've ever seen. And there's a lot at stake for the country, and, and the drama is very high. Everyone kind of feels very passionately that um, as we do this, this series, the first 12, as we come back in the summer and then we come back again in the fall, that we're really trying to create something that will stand the test of time, not something that you... Not something that will have real impact as you watch it in a given week, but that you could not only watch a couple weeks later or a few months later, but that maybe, you know, hopefully people will look back, you know, years from now and be able to say, that's a pretty good, a pretty resonant record. It's not everything, but it's evocative of the high points of this campaign, that it illustrates some of the really key uh, figures in it, the tensions between them, what those people were like, what the big turning points were in the race, um, that it'll kind of stand the test of time as kind of a, as, as a historical record. At least that's what we're all aspiring to. And as I say, it's been kind of inspiring to work with a bunch of people uh, at Showtime and at Left Right, our production partners, who all have those same kind of pretty high ambitions. Everybody's taken a pretty big swing with this series, and we're really um, really thrilled with how it's worked out so far. Charles, do you want to ask the last question? Um, well, I was going to ask one question, but it would feel kind of anticlimactic. So I think that's just a good strong point to end on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, uh, uh, John and Mark, uh, thank you so much for talking with us. Uh, this, uh, we wish you the best of luck at the Emmys. I know I'll be rooting for you, and uh, we'll see if we can get Catherine Harris to supervise the voting process there. Can I say, can I say just a few more things? Hanging Chad. Yeah, of course. Thank you for Gold Derby, yeah. big fans, and yeah. Baba Booey. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. And there so, you yeah. go.